Thanks everybody for tuning in. Really excited to have Todd McKinnon from Okta, the CEO of Okta here. And um, Todd, I just want to start by saying thank you and and by saying uh, I've I've followed you and looked up to you for a while as a as a person and as a business leader. Uh, and it's really exciting to just have you here. So thank you. Thanks for having me. That's a lot of pressure to put on me. Yeah, no, live up no to pressure. That no, no pressure. Um, <laughs> Careful what you say. So, Don't let them down. Yeah. <laughs> So Todd, I kind of want to start uh, maybe in a kind of a different place from from some of the other podcasts and things I've heard you on. Um, I think the story of starting Okta and how you pitched your wife on it with a, a PowerPoint deck, that's all super interesting. Um, but you've shared that a lot and, and, you know, we'll also share that with our listeners so that make sure they're aware of it. But I know something else you're, you're really passionate about is um, mental and physical health. Uh, I follow you on Twitter and you talk about that stuff a lot. And so, especially after 2020, I'd, I'd like that to be kind of where we start is just how, how has, how have you maintained your focus on physical and mental health? And then more broadly, like how have you applied that to Okta, especially through 2020, which was a kind of a crazy year for everybody. There's like a personal part of that. And then there's a, a leadership part of that. And I think on the personal side, it's, um, I think, I think mental health, well, mental health is a, it's a, a very, very important thing and serious thing. And um, I, for me, I don't mean to uh, uh, underestimate problems or mental health or the challenges people have there. Uh, but for me personally, I think that if I've been in my life, if I've been physically active and physically, uh, you know, done workouts and push my body. And um, that's always led to me having mental health for me and feeling good. And um, I think that, I, I don't know how exactly this works, but I think I'm one of those people that has, um, is really uh, receptive to endorphins. <laughs> so I, I must have a lot of receptors or something because physical exertion ever since I was a little kid was always felt really good to me. And, um, I've always been in love with moving and sports and competition. And so fast forward to kind of your question, 2020, it's, um, been really important for me to keep active and keep moving and keep that, keep those workouts going. And, um, it's led to me being, uh, happier and more motivated and more clear thinking. You know, I always, uh, I, I get some of my best ideas when I'm on a bike ride. Uh, you know, get out there on the bike and see the scenery and um, get some time to think and come up with these ideas. So it's that physical activity is really important for me. Yeah. So that's the, that's the person, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but that's the, um, that's the personal side. I think on the leadership side, uh, one of the things, and I'm sure a lot of people have experienced similar things this past year, a part of a big part of my job was as a leader was being visible to the employees of Okta and to the customers of Okta and to the um, partners and so forth, investors, all the people in the, in, the, uh, in the ecosystem. And that visibility, I felt like when I couldn't go to the office anymore, once the shelter in place order started to happen, that felt really like I, I couldn't do part of my job. Like it was harder for me to be visible. So one of the things I did was um, try to just share more online about, um, about what I was doing, even personal stuff like you know workouts or things that were happening outside of work. I felt like that was a way to me, for me to keep that connection and keep that, um, fulfill that leadership role that I think is really important. And um, it's worked both ways. I think it's, it's been, it's, I think I've gotten good feedback from employees and customers and investors. And I think for me, it's, it's, I think it's been a way for me to make me not just feel good and have good mental health, but also feel like I'm uh, being an effective leader of, of Okta. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I was going to ask you kind of exactly that question is, um, that's one of the things I've noticed from you and, and I, from a lot of business leaders in 2020 is more activity on social media and, and Twitter. And, um, so since you brought that up, um, I, I guess there's, there's pros and cons to that too. Right. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, there is, <laughs> let, uh, I'm assuming it's, it's been beneficial, uh, but also what are some things that, uh, I don't know, some things you've had to be careful of out there being more active on, on social media, especially as CEO of a, a public company. 
Um, I think that it's 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 been great, like personally, and I, I just my perspective on it's been great. Um, and and that's based on just feedback I've gotten and opportunities that have come up for the company and visibility we've we've had. I think that the the downside or the, one of the things I've learned or uh, something that's very important is that it's important, you know, you got to separate. At, so my role as the leader and the CEO of Okta, um, there's whenever I say something or I express an opinion or uh, take a position or it's going to be obviously construed as the as in me with my role as the CEO of Okta, right? Um, so I have to be mindful of that and make sure that the opinions I express are uh, exp opinions and perspectives and, and uh, things that would be, you know, broadly representative of the employees of Okta and the, um, and the customers of Okta. And it's, so it's broader than just, you know, maybe some people on social media can just spout off their own personal opinions, which I think is good. But I'm in a different position, right? I represent yeah. an employee base. I represent investors. I represent customers, and it's still about taking positions. But you got to make sure that they're going to be construed as if I am the CEO of Octa, because I am. So yeah. you got to make sure they're consistent with that. And um, it's and I think it's an important thing to 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 you know consider when you're taking a position on things on social media in the in a role like this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and and I appreciate your your approach, and I, I feel like you're uh, you're down to earth enough, but you also definitely keep that level of professionalism that, that I would hope and expect to see from a, a CEO of a, a company like Octa. So that that's awesome. Um, so we timed this podcast pretty well. It was just Octa's 12th birthday and, uh, the company account tweeted out a, a pretty cool thread that it was on, um, January 23rd, which was is that today? Is that is today the 23rd? Whatever. I think today's it's three, date days is. Ago. three days I ago. Know. <laughs> I don't even know what the date is. That's that's uh at home world. Um yeah. but anyways, they we're they recording some... this actually. It's the 14th birthday now, Austin. <laughs> oh geez, I'm way I'm off. Just no, it was um, three days ago, yeah. three days ago. <laughs> Six years in the future. Um they so the company they linked to your first tweet, which was I thought this was interesting, June 11, 2009. Uh, your first tweet was really insightful. It was, uh, you said you were busy building a new company. Um, <laughs> and then in, in 2010, nowhere to go but up, Austin, nowhere to go yeah, but up. Yeah, yeah your, your Twitter presence has, uh, you've really improved. Your comms team is doing a great job. Uh, <laughs> in 2010, this is the first point I want to hit on from, from this feed. Uh, you and um, Frederick Karras decided to change the name from uh, Sasher to Okta. And my first question is, um, how did you make it so long with such a bad name? And then the the second question is just what were you going through at the time? Um, maybe the evolution at the company at the time that, that led you to think more strategically about uh, what the name should represent and, and where Okta was going at, you know, back in uh, 2010. Well, the, the original idea for Okta was a systems management company. So that would be a product that would management or would monitor and manage all of your SaaS applications. So it was like SAS Assure, right? SAS Assure. Um, yeah, totally. Turns, I totally get it. Yeah, so <laughs> you wanted to buy that. The, but the, but the, what it turns out is, as we talked to more people, that was kind of an interesting niche company, but it wasn't didn't have broad appeal in the people we were talking to about potential buyers and so forth. Um, so very early, even you know, right in the first couple of months of working with Freddie, we pivoted to this. What really became. Um, if you look at the product mockups we drew right when we pivoted, it looks very much like Okta, right? It's it's identity management, it's users, it's applications, it's devices. Um, and so with that context, it, it didn't really make sense to call it Sashur anymore. And so the reason we liked Okta because it had a tie-in, it, it, it's a meteorological scale for cloud cover. And we were all about helping companies adopt the cloud by providing this identity service that would increase security and reliability. And this whole, I like the tie-in of um, Okta as a scale for cloud cover. And the probably is as important was that it, it was a short URL and the product was gonna be, you would go to okta.com and then log into your app. So we wanted a short, easy to remember domain name. And so we bought the Okta domain name from, get this, from the Overseas Korean Trading Association. <laughs> 
so we bought that domain and we got the name octa.com and then that tweet we launched it at a, i remember uh there was a like a um startup launching event and we got the new name ready and the brand and we launched it at that that event yeah and and so that's interesting that um the the mock-ups you had at the time you pivoted are, are very similar to to where the company's gone today but i mean back then identity management especially cloud based identity management wasn't really a thing right so what gave you the the vision or the foresight to know that that was going to be a an industry worth pursuing uh, and that you would even have a chance with with what the competition was back then that's the thing that's misunderstood or not you have to really go through it to have an appreciation for it about startups is that you have to do something that is really crazy and out there um because if you're if you don't then it's no one's going to buy from you because why would they buy from you and they can buy from the established vendor that's already doing something yeah. that's pretty normal um but that feels as you would imagine feels very crazy and risky and like it's not going to work so your natural inclination is to when you're starting a company is to kind of revert back to the things that have already been done and not be too crazy and the the thing that made what we were doing crazy was you know we weren't the first identity management system we weren't the first person to do login and single sign on but we were the first one to build it totally as a cloud service and the thesis was that as more and more applications and services and infrastructure move to the cloud the center of gravity would shift so that at some point it would make sense to just do your identity and your security from the cloud too and that's what people missed people didn't people thought that was not never going to be something that would be tolerated like well, i want to keep the security in my firewall i don't want to trust anyone with it and they missed that the, in the context of the overall center of gravity shifting it would make sense to have identity and security in the cloud and it was kind of just a bet and for a while it didn't seem like it was going to work like it didn't seem like people would um say it was a good idea and try out the product, but there wasn't, everyone kind of knew the cloud was coming, but there wasn't really enough apps. There was Salesforce and some apps like Workday, um, but you know, most of the email was still on premise with Outlook and so forth. And the first couple of years were hard, but little by little, the, the product got a little better. We got integrated to more things. The um, you know, the company got, we got better at selling it and talking about it. And we got, you know, little by little, we got more customers, but the big shift was that there was just the center of gravity. There was just more apps. There were more new small companies doing apps in the cloud. There was email and collaboration, like Google apps started to be email in the cloud. And, um, and that's when it really started to take off. And it, and it went from be, being this crazy risky new thing to being this um, <clears throat> really a better way to do things. Yeah. Um, and, and so in the, obviously the, the market's there and since, uh, 2009, I think you've really proven that, that the approach you're taking is working and, and that that's shown in the it's a $33 billion market cap company. Um, in that thread, you know, the, the company profile shared out 2,600 employees. Uh, and I think, I think you work for 2,600 employees and I, and I, believe that you probably look at it the same way. Uh, and then you also support 9,400 brands across the globe. That's um, that what I'm most you. proud of the customers. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That trust I mean, I'm proud of the employees too. I'm proud of the customers. I'm proud of the products, um, the partners, the market cap is what it is. I mean, that, that'll be a reflection of those other things, but yeah, it kind of starts with customers. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, 9,400 customers that, that, uh, trust you for their identity management. Um, and on the website, it says, you know, that's just to, at the highest level, that's primarily through access and authentication. So could you spend um, just a minute talking about how, or a few minutes talking about how Okta's products have evolved and, and how you've managed to scale to 9,600 or 9,400 customers. Um, and, and on the website, it's basically broken down right now uh, into workforce identity and customer identity. So I guess in that context, can you talk a little bit about the evolution of the platform or moving to a platform and then and then just the product in general? My team would, I say things like the first mock-up that I drew is looks like the product today. And my team would laugh at that. They'd be like, 
your silly mock-up you drew, Todd, looks nothing like the product today. <laughs> what I mean by that is the, the basic concepts, right? Like the basic concepts of you have a list of users and a directory and a list of any applications that are integrated to it. Literally, the, the product is dramatically, looks dramatically different than our first mock-ups. And yeah. it's, we've added tons of functionality and, and, um, and modules and products. The main, the main, uh, the thing about like you talked about or we talked about um, getting started and picking this business and having it be crazy. The one thing that we were, it was a calculated risk, right? But the one thing, the two things we knew very early were one was that there was pain for the problem of doing authentication into your cloud apps. That was harder in 2010, 2011 than the traditional like just log into your network and get online into your data center. So we knew there was pain there. So we knew that we could solve that pain point and, and start to build a business there. Um, the, you know, we weren't sure if you know, being in the cloud would be too crazy and people would really adopt it, but we knew there was pain. And then the second thing we knew was that if you built a system to, you know, the, the you actually had to build a lot to solve that pain. You had to build a, a lot of redundancy, a lot of reliability, super high security. You had to build a database in the cloud. You had to build um, servers that knew how to talk to different protocols. You had to build a reporting engine. Um, so we knew that if we 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 build that all, we built that all, we could we could really manage the the system of record for identity for every user in an organization. That was a a really great point to expand and build a big important company around. Um, just because we knew how hard that initial pain point was to solve and the foundation we'd be laying. So um, if you fast forward from the early days, the, the, the two big vectors of expansion were, um, the first was, you know, from a single sign-on system to a multi-product workforce identity system. So um, it's one thing to log you into all your applications, it's something else to also offer you two-factor authentication, strong authentication, and a and a server, uh, you know, AI-based um, risk analysis system that tells you and your IT people when you have to do two-factor and so forth. So that's product expansion from single sign-on to multi-factor authentication to user provisioning. Um, so it's like multiple products on the workforce side. The other big vector of expansion over the years was, and this is a huge one, it's from workforce only to customer identity. When we started, it was all about employees and workforce and we're gonna make your people more productive. And it was actually our customers that came to us and started saying, you know, we, we love this thing, but we wanna use it for our customers too. Um, I remember there was a big uh, pharmaceutical company that wanted to use Okta to log their doctors in to get information about their treatments they were prescribing. Um, so those weren't employees. Those were like just, you know, people out in the world that wanted to get information about this medicine. So um, more and more customers wanted to do, do that. And that's when we started supporting customer identity, which is so, uses some of the same basic building blocks, but it, it has different requirements. Like it's got to be much more approachable for developers because customer facing solutions are mostly built by de developers and they want to take their identity and build it into their own um, their own code they're developing. So it's much more API based, much more the documentation has a higher uh, requirements for good documentation and the, um, the pricing and the licensing is different. So that was a huge expansion. And then where we are now is um, kind of in the midst of the third great expansion, which is identity is not seen as just something that will make your, use for, your workforce more productive or make your customer facing solutions easier to build and and make them more secure, but it's kind of the key to the whole future of security. Because everyone knows now, especially after COVID, that users are gonna be remote and the default is not in the office or in the data center, it's like remote from anywhere. And to do that, you can't rely on firewalls because the you're not behind the network perimeter. So you really have to have a good handle on identity. And identity is the key into everything you wanna do about security, whether it's um, the posture of the device, do you wanna, are you gonna let someone in based on is their device have malware on it? Um, whether that's the analytics you wanna do on usage to detect if, um, although you've authenticated this user, does the usage mean that you wanna authenticate them again because it's anomalous usage? It's basically identity has become, or is in the process and will become in the future even much more 
the core of all security, which you're talking about, you know, each one of these expansions from workforce identity, which is traditionally was like a $6 billion TAM. And we think now it's closer to 25 or $30 billion um, customer identity, which the TAM there is on the order of $25 billion as well as more and more people want to connect with their customers and then security. I mean, that's always been um, a massive area of spending and a, more of that over time is going to go to identity. So we're very bullish on the future. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for breaking that down. That's um, super helpful to hear. And I'm, I'm sure um, everybody listening and that, that'll be a helpful breakdown as well. Have, uh, and I'm, uh, and so real quick, break if this is one of those questions that's not uh, a question that you're comfortable answering Todd um, you can just tell me and then we'll completely cut this part out or um, I'll cut what I'm saying now out I'm great as just... I'm great at the no answer answer yeah <laughs> what I want to get into is asking about um, the future potential roadmap and consumer identity uh -huh, yeah. uh, if that if that's I can talk about that... no I can talk about it at a high level yeah, yeah. okay yeah. Um, Todd, that's, that's great. Thanks for the, the breakdown. That's, that really helps to visualize uh, kind of where the company's at today. And so that kind of brings me to the next question I wanted to ask, which was just talking a little bit about what the product roadmap over the next you know high level over the next two or three years. And I asked a question out there on Twitter, um, since you have so many fans out there now and you're, you're so prolific out there on, on Twitter. Uh, and one of the more popular questions that came back was asking if there is the potential or possibility for moving into consumer facing identity. And, and for people that are listening, that, that looks like, you know, maybe something where consumers sign up me as a consumer, I would go to Okta and sign up and then manage my identity from there and be able to, to decide or give access to different companies. Maybe that's for a rewards subscription or a program or something like that. Uh, at a high level, is that something, a, a direction that Okta, could go in the future? It's exciting. I think that you're talking about, um, you're talking about, you know, universal digital identity. And it's, it's kind of been the something people have thought about forever. Um, usually, you know, you, it was usually just back in the day before the internet really got big, it was more technical people or um, people that thought a lot about the depths of technology, but now with technology pervading our lives to the degree it has, it's really everyone understands the pain, right? All the different accounts and um, registering for sites and different passwords and the issues with user privacy and um, concerns about security. It's a big problem that everyone recognizes. I think the challenge, the challenge of it has been um, getting a system and a standard that's been agreed that could be agreed on by enough people to to get have it get momentum and be universally applicable so that's been the challenge it's the kind of the bootstrap problem you have to get enough users to use it to get the service providers to accept it and interact with it and then you have to get enough service providers to get enough you know that accept it and interact with it to get enough users to use it um, so that's been the challenge so i think that um the the opportunity for Okta to influence this is a couple ways. The main way is through um, what I've talked about with our customer identity products and business. Um, the value proposition for those products today to customers is really about making their development efforts more efficient, right? Um, but as, as we help more and more customers power the identity for their customer facing solutions, another value prop we could provide is, is enable them to more easily connect with consumers, make it easier to log in, make it easier to exchange personal information. Um, so that it, from the customer identity perspective, it would be a logical extension for us to make there. Um, the, the other thing I'll say about it is that it's something that we would pursue in a, like a, we would need a consortium, right? You, you, you would need people, you need partners to work with you, you would need all. And I think that the way you get that is, you provide a solution that's so valuable and open enough that everyone can see the obvious benefits and, and no one gets threatened. Like no one thinks that if um, like none of the big platforms get threatened to think we're gonna take away their advertising business or we're gonna take away their hardware business, right? Um, so I think you have to get momentum. You have to have an open standards. It has to, open standard it has to be great for consumers uh, and it has to be beneficial to the people providing the information services that want to connect with those consumers. So um, 
those are my thoughts on it. And it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. I think that it, you know, the, the vision for Okta is to enable anyone to safely use any technology. And if you think about fulfilling that vision, this global digital identity standard is an important part of it long-term. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, another kind of in- interesting topic that's maybe a bit forward thinking is uh, what the prolifer- proliferation of blockchain technology looks like and in- how Okta plays a part in it. And um, there's I actually read a, a research paper, a, a white paper on Okta's web- website about Okta in the blockchain. And basically there's just a example of secure key technologies uh it says they developed a functional secure credentialing sharing network between financial institutions and the uh, canada revenue agency to simplify the login process for canadian consumers so um, i'll share that out when we when we share this podcast but could you just offer a few thoughts on on how okta can i guess coexist with with the proliferation of, of blockchain? Because somebody might think about that and think that uh, as blockchain grows, the need for something like Okta is less, but I, I actually think it's probably the opposite. Blockchain is a underlying technology. It's an underlying way to have a distributed, uh, trustable, non-reputable database of information. Um, and I think that that is, uh, I think we're all trying to figure out exactly how that gets used is it is there properties of that that can help us solve this digital identity this universal digital identity standard um is there are there properties of that that can help solve specific use cases where like in the example you mentioned a customer needs to um share security tokens or or public keys with partners and so forth um can blockchain help us do that i think we're all trying to figure it out and it's definitely a breakthrough, but like other computer science breakthroughs, there's always um, things that are applicable for and things that are not. And so I think we're kind of sorting through what what use cases it's gonna work for and what it's not. And I think you see a little bit in the last couple of years, you've seen a little bit of overfitting, right? There's an awesome new technology, blockchain. So everyone's trying to overfit applications for it. <laughs> well, it'll be healthcare, it'll be, you know, uh, electronic grid it'll be this and that um and that'll kind of wane i think and you'll see several really important applications emerge on the blockchain or on blockchains um and maybe global digital identity is one of them um maybe there's other identity use cases but i don't i mean the value of okta ultimately is um i think it's the connections it's the integrations it's the it's the um you know, being pre-integrated to uh, millions, potentially billions of users, it's, uh, or thousands, hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of applications and services and many, many devices. So I think that the, the technology on how that is done or other things that might be integrated around that network, um, it's not threatening to it, it's almost extending it. So that's how I think about the technological underpinnings and then how that fits in vis-a-vis Okta. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a, the similar, I mean, I came to a similar conclusion is, is that I feel like it only makes identity more important. Um, Hopefully that's what our white paper said too. Hopefully it, yeah. say something. <laughs> yeah. it was completely different. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we talked a little bit about, um, you know, mental and physical health, especially in 2020, which was the, the year impacted by COVID. Right. But, um, as, as an investor and, and, uh, you know, I've, as a personal investor, I've invested in companies, uh, you know, a lot of cloud-based companies and forward leading software companies. And I consider Okta one of them. Um, what I saw through 2020 was that there were certain companies that because they're cloud-based and, and help other companies be, you know, more digitally native or more remote. and and I put Okta in this category as a company that helps, obviously that helps companies do that. Uh, Not that you had it easy as a company, but because of the way the company has been built from the ground up, you were in a position to uh, do well as, and that's a tough thing to say through COVID because it was, it's such a hard thing and it's been so hard for so many uh, families. And so um, 
just want to acknowledge that as we're talking about, you know, the, the success of a business. But what I'm trying to get at is, is that we had this kind of generational thing come up in 2020. And because Okta is a company that is, is, has a cloud first product and, and helps companies make that transition, you're in a position to, uh, to do well and help other companies through this. But as we move forward, you know, from a leader per, leadership perspective, how are you thinking about what the next the next steps might be, and and what where maybe the natural advantage you had going into a situation like this runs out, and it, to where you could be set up to think to to be back on your heels and think you know we're okay, we've got this, but but where really you have to be thinking about what are we doing wrong, what can we improve. Uh, where do we need to improve as a company? I don't know if I asked that com- that question very well, but just the potential that you were you're deceived by by the initial response, and how you have to think about that moving yeah, forward. Yeah, a couple of thoughts on that. First is I, I get questions from investors a lot to the kind of to the to the point of did the did COVID nineteen pull forward a bunch of demand into your business that now you're going to have to like it's not going to be there for the next couple of years, right? And it's interesting question because it's totally wrong. I mean, it's not, that's not the case at all, I believe. I think that what we see in our business is um, there's a tipping point, like do customers get the cloud? Are they doing a bunch of stuff in the cloud? And once they are, we get in there, we help them secure that environment, enable remote work, make it easy for their employees, and once that starts happening, they buy more and more and more of our products. Yeah. That's why one of the reasons why our net retention is so high, you know, this last quarter, the um, Q3, it was uh, 123%, right? Um, so it's, it's the, like the, the fact that people are getting, doing more cloud, doing more remote work, seeing how identity is prime or is of primary importance and all that. Is, is great for our business and it's great for the f- future of our business because they've just tipped over into this zone where they're gonna need more and more and they can benefit from more and more products for Okta. That's one thing. On the customer identity side, you're seeing companies that that market is really about, for us is about like build versus buy. And it's about, um, should they build identity themselves in their customer facing solution or solutions or should they, uh, should they buy it from a, from Okta or you know a company like Okta? And the 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 pressing need to get online with you know because of the to react to the pandemic has has really taken that choice away. Like they don't have time; they have to buy it. And so once they once they've bought it, they're going to see the benefits of it. And it's like the best marketing for you know word of mouth marketing. It's like oh, it was easy; it worked for us. And that's why as a company, I mentioned before the ninety five hundred customers we're so proud of customer success is critical. We, we try everything we can do to make them all successful because word of mouth is our best marketing and they're going to refer us to their colleagues and their friends. And um, so the fact that, you know, they're try, they're, they're more likely to buy customer identity because of the pandemic, we make them successful. That's good, not just for this year or next year, but for, for far, far, far into the future. Um, so that's, that's interesting dynamic in my conversation with investors. From a leadership perspective, I think that, um, one of the one of the most important parts of my job is keeping the company hungry. Yeah, I, you know, because if you're going to be one of the you know people talk about growth and right and the the challenges with growth and I think a lot of times they mean things like you know you got it's a lot of it's like a lot of planning and a lot of you got to get ahead of the curve and you have to like you know you have to think ahead in terms of who you need and what processes you need to put in place. But the one thing people miss about growth is that. As, if you're growing for any number of years, you have you have the risk of a culture that hits or meets its targets, because by definition you're hitting or meeting your targets because you're growing, right? And then you, you have the ri- risk of a culture that hits or meets its targets and then falls into complacency because they just hit their target, right? So it's like a big part of the leadership challenge becomes how do you keep the company hungry? How do you balance between you don't want to burn anyone out, you don't want to just be never satisfied and like you know, um, not enjoy what you've done, but you also can't fall into this mindset that that is all we could do. Because the, the, the reality of the journey we're on is that the first, you know, for so long, it was just about 
proving out that this was going to be viable yeah. and proving out it was going to be successful. And now we've gotten to a point where we have this amazing set of products and this customer base and this team and this brand. Now it really gets interesting what we can do. And it's my job as the CEO to make sure that everyone knows that. And I impart that with a sense of urgency um, because that's not obvious to everyone. A lot of people first glance, look at us and they're like, Oh, 9,400 customers. That's how much more could they have? Oh, you know, it's like identity for workforce and customer identity. How much more could they do? Well, it's like, that's just a foundation. I mean, the, if you look back in 10 years or 20 years, um, the, you know, if, if you have that mindset now, we're going to look back in, you know, 10 years and, and be really disappointed with what we've accomplished because the potential is so high. And that's my biggest fear. Like, I don't want to look back in 10 years and say, oh man, we could have just, if we would have focused a little more or been a little more hungry or been a little more aggressive, we could have accomplished so much, but we fell short of that. That'd be, that'd be a shame. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good, good point. Um, and I think I'd love to hear if you can, if you can share some of the things you're doing to, to help, uh, you know, keep that hunger both in yourself and in the company. But I would imagine one of the ways is, is, um, just trying to breed a and, and build a culture that is kind of in love with the process and in love with the ability to help companies through, you know, your customers through something like COVID where, you know, I, I would imagine that um, companies like Okta and, and as well as other cloud-based applications and software and infrastructure, that's helped a lot of customers survive through yeah. COVID. And so, um, yeah, if you have any thoughts on, or if you can share just a couple of things you're, you're doing to keep that hunger and then, uh, maybe a, a story or two of, of what you're most proud of, uh, about the team and about Okta, maybe it's helping, you know, a customer that, that you've helped and something you can share through, through COVID in 2020. A lot of the leadership is, uh, setting an example. So people, it sounds obvious, but people respond to the example of their leaders and yeah. the tone that their leaders set. So if, if I'm hungry, if I'm, you know, striking the right balance between being demanding when I should be, of course, always being um, accepting of reality and so forth, but of being hungry and, and ambitious, a lot of it trickles down. Uh, you know, a lot of people, people look at that and they, it's, a, it's tone setting. I mean, you have to be, you have to communicate and you have to build a relationship with the team so that they know you're genuine and they know that um, it's not an act. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but a lot of it can come from example setting and the way my team, my direct reports behave. And, and then that, that filters out across the company through the various connections people have. Um, and then there's also just, you know, the way we're, it's not all example. I mean, it's like the, the goals we're setting up for the objectives we want to hit, whether it's the, the budgets and the investment, right? Are we, are we trying to be super, super cost, con cost conscious on every investment we make, or are we willing to invest at a level which is going to lead more likely to lead to innovation? I mean, we're obviously frugal and flex and um, smart with money, but we, we're 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 very open to investing for innovation and to building a long-term company. A lot of it too is alignment. I mean, we do a lot in the company to make sure people are aligned on what we're trying to do, and making sure that we continuously communicate what we're trying to do in a way that's um, like doesn't try to be too perfect. Like we don't. You can never, it's always about constantly updating the communication and keep iterating on it and keep communicating and as things shift, you know, stay back at it. In fact, one of the, one of the things that I think was a strength for us during COVID was our agility and our ability to adapt internally to a changing dynamic market. Um, and I think that relationship and that openness and that transparency and that back and forth between me and my team and the entire company is something we, you have to build up. You can't, you can't just start doing that when you need it. I joke that if you, if you got to COVID last year as a company and for the first time, the CEO was having all hands with the team, regular all hands meetings. If you hadn't been doing that for eight years, you just scare the team to death, right? They're going to yeah. be like, this must really be bad. 
the CEO yeah. is on an all hands from his bedroom. <laughs> it's like, we yeah. must really be in trouble. <laughs> um, but I'd been doing that all along. And, and so when we got to COVID, it was more natural for me to get on there and just say, yeah, this, we don't really know. Like we're figuring it out. We're thinking about how we're going to spend. We're going to think about how we're going to tweak things. Um, and then throughout the year, just making sure we were really good about um, keep, keep, keep adjusting and keep communicating and keep being open about and keeping a lot al- being aligned on what we're trying to do. Um, we've had a, t- it is a lot of, it is very satisfying for the team to, to help companies in this time. But I think we're also humble in that we don't, we're just a small part of, of yeah. what, what they're going through. And for every story of, um, you know, the, we have awesome customers that are, you know, in the food distribution business or, you know, things that you can't shut, you can't go remote. I mean, if you're, if you're, uh, your job is to distribute millions and millions of pounds of food to, to restaurants, you can't go remote. You have to do that physically. And, and our customers that, you know, use Okta to keep running in those environments, it's, yeah, we, we get excited about that and we love helping them, but we also are humble enough to know that it's not all, all us. <laughs> they're doing yeah. heroes works and they're doing heroes work and they, they have other partners and we're, we're happy to fit into the ecosystem and do our part. Um, because, you know, that's, that's kind of what's needed when times get tough. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's one of the, my, my wife is, a um, she's an RN registered nurse. And, uh, one of the things I think about, and I'm just thankful for over the last year is that our hospitals got really overloaded in some places, but broadly across the the country, United States, you know, our medical system didn't completely break down and our food distribution and and water distribution didn't break down. And and so, yeah, I'm a huge fan of all the cloud companies and and all the technology, but like, if those things broke, we would be in a, a much different situation you know so that's a that's a great point yeah the u.s yeah robust country great country yeah yeah um okay so we're kind of getting close to time here but um i know octane your your annual conference is is kind of a huge event for the company and uh again back to that the the thread the birthday thread um the first one was in 2013 and then your last completely in-person one was 2019 and then this in 2020 you moved to fully remote and i think i might be off but i think okta because of when your conference was was really the first or one of the very first large scale conferences like that in 2020 yeah, so it you was definitely the first it was april, yeah. <laughs> it was april 1st and i think all the lockdowns started and in- yeah March, right? So I think like RSA, which is a big security show in San Francisco every every spring, was the last in person one, and then everything started going remote. We were the first ones, and I all of your listeners, if you go back and watch the Octane video, just remember that we we literally had two <laughs> weeks and we were the first because it is shot on my iPhone from my dining room table. <laughs> so just remember yeah. that you were the first. <laughs> I, I thought it was I thought it was great. Um, Thank I you. loved You're your the. The comedy stunts that she did. I think you're <laughs> you're a natural. Uh, it is true. I think I did. Sing did a you song. even sing? You might. Did you sing in that? Was there a song that you sang? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. There was a there was a song, Austin. You could judge for yourself whether I sang or not, but there was a song. <laughs> um, um, okay, so so real quick, you know why why have a conference like that? Some people that aren't super familiar with with Okta in the industry might think that that's um it's wasteful to, to do a conference like that. So a kind of what's the, what's the broader purpose and, and why is it important to, to Okta? And then just some thoughts on, on what Octane looks like going forward. I would imagine you saw some, some efficiencies with scale of having, you know, what was it? Uh, 20 or 30,000 people versus uh, off the top of my head, five, six, yeah, five, six, six or seven, something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what's the purpose of it? And then the benefits of, of scale and moving digital. And I imagine you're going to have a hybrid in the future. The, so Octane 21 is coming up. Uh, it'll be early in April again this year, and it will be all online. Um, so we're really excited about that. And I think it will have uh, amazing reach and we're, it's going to be great. It's going to, we're going to take all everyone's learnings from a year of online events and it's going to be the best online event ever. Um, so you should definitely check that out if you're interested in Okta. The, I think that the, um, 
the reason to have the conference is there's a couple of reasons. The first one is it's, I talked about the customers and how valuable they are and how valuable customer success is. And it's, it's really a good way for them to kind of get together, get trained, collaborate, best practices, network, build relationships. Um, it's like, it's a way to get our customers more value from the Okta ecosystem. That's an important part of it. Of course, in person, that means classes, social events, so forth. Um, online, that's one of the things we tweaked. It's like, you know, it's more online content and it's, and then frankly, it's not some of the online platforms. It's it's not a fully solved problem. It's how do you get a group of people collaborating and networking in an online event, you know? Um, and hopefully we do a better job of that this year. We did a decent job last year, but you know, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. So that's one thing. The other, that and that's probably, people would guess that. I think the other thing that's not as obvious to people is that this, a lot of these, you know, Okta being one of them, these companies are new movements and there's a lot of evangelizing. And especially back in 2013, the biggest value of Octane was that you would get people in a physical room with hundreds and then eventually thousands of people and it would be validating that they're not alone. Yeah. Enterprise, I mean, like people, people bet their jobs when they buy Okta. And if you can get someone in a big room, it, it's comforting. It's like, look, I'm not, I'm surrounded by people. That, it's like a movement, right? Yeah. And then you, especially, you, uh, especially for something like security and identity management, oh, it's yeah, kind of a big yeah, deal yeah. to know. And then you, and then the last thing I'll say there too is that it's 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 a launch event, so you get a lot of momentum internally in the company to hit that milestone, and that's and dates and and milestones are motivating to people. Um, it's a it's a rhythm to to run the company around from a product development and R and It's not perfect because. There's other factors that go into product releases and R&D than just when the conference is going to be, but um, it's good to have a rhythm there and milestones to keep the company marching forward. Talk about talk about staying hungry and staying ambitious, right? Yeah. <laughs> you got yeah, to get the next thing out. You got to launch. You got to make the next one better better than the last one and yeah. better than Signal and all the other, the other conferences out there. Um, cool. So another thing I'm a huge fan of is, and I've actually used this as an investor, um, and I can't believe the data that you share in this is the Okta Business at Work report. Um, how, what's the origin story of that? And then uh, what's, you know, how is that valuable to uh, and to your customers? The, so businesses at work is, um, and there's a new, there's a new report actually. It's, it's coming out, you know, we're, we're, we're going to release it very soon. Um, so probably by the time this goes out on the, on the podcast land, it'll be out there, but you can see it at our web, at our website, octa.com, a search for businesses at work 2021. It's essentially, um, it's aggregate usage data across our 9,400 customers, across all the services they use. And the origin story is there's two reasons for it. One is that back in the early days, it was, we were trying to get PR for Okta so more people would know about us. But the other reason was we, we, were, we wanted to provide it to our customers so the customers could get insight into how the, all their peers were using technology. What apps were they using? What apps in certain vertical industries? What, you know, like as companies grew and got to certain sizes, what, what communications and collaborations technologies? Because they you might see a band of cohorts use certain kind of collaboration apps when they're small, but then graduate to something as they got to a few hundred employees. So that was the idea. The idea was PR and also to more importantly, to give our customers insight and give back to them insight in an aggregate way that they could use, uh, they could use in a valuable way as they make their own technology purchasing decisions. So um, it's really become a popular, popular thing. Uh, we've even seen, you know, people have asked us, um, Hey, can I get a proprietary view into this so I can make you know investing decisions based on the apps in this thing? And we haven't done that, but um, we haven't done that. But the you know the data is is um, it's useful. A tech, planning yeah. technology and using technology and is hard, and, and the, the degree which we can provide data or build products, you know, and we're doing this more and more. We're building, we're we're taking that data and having a feedback loop into the product. So we have a product that's called Threat Insights, which is, it's a security product, but it's powered by all of the threats we see across our entire customer base. IP addresses trying to attack or trying to do password spray attacks into our customer base. And we use that to block those IP addresses from everyone else in the network. And so that's an example of 
how we're taking our data and making it making the products more valuable. And, and we'll do that more and more going forward. We'll take our, our data we have and use that to power our products and make better products. Yeah. Um, I, I think I had a little connection issue there. Todd, can you still hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're loud and clear. Okay, great. Um, yeah, that's awesome. I'm a, I'm a huge fan. Of, and I mean, uh, I, I don't even think you need proprietary data to make informed, at least long-term investing decisions based off of some of the data and that's just shared out publicly in business that where you, you could see the growth of zoom for like, it was, it was dead obvious. Um, yeah. Slack too. Slack before that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So great. Uh, I want to wind this down and, and we're, we're coming up on two minutes here, but um, love to just, just learn, especially from leaders like you who outside of Okta uh, have you learned the most from? And, and maybe what do you, what do you focus on learning right now? Who are you, who are you following right now? What do you, what are you learning? Oh man, that's another hour. <laughs> <laughs> I say, so I think that there's a couple people um, I would mention. One is that uh, Ben Horowitz is on the Okta board and he's, I have a great board at Okta. It's a, uh, We've worked a lot on making it a killer board, a killer asset to the company. Ben has been there from the beginning. He was the first, they did our first seed investment, Andrews and Horowitz did. Um, and he was the first board member, outside board member to join. He's been there the whole time. And he's he's super valuable to me as a, um, you know, as someone who I, all the really hard questions, the things I'm really stuck on, he's the, he's the person I call in terms of the first call I make on the board. The, the board is like I call other board members for specific things, but he's the most common one I'll call like first when things are really hard. I have a really hard decision to make um, that's on the board. And then another CEO that I've known for a long time, I used to work for him. Um, and he was my mentor early in the career was uh, Peter Gassner, who is the CEO of Viva Software. I don't know if you're familiar with Viva, but um, yeah, yeah, built off of um, Salesforce, right? Yeah, yeah. Peter is. Uh, amazing CEO, great person, a friend of mine. Uh, again, we've been, we worked together at PeopleSoft many, many years ago. Um, and so he's, he, he's one I talk to often for, um, you know, he's running a company that's, you know, a little bit bigger and more scaled out than Okta. So it's super, super relevant. Like we're, we're you know, we were, where Ben is more in the investing world and his recent um, experience and knowledge is more around, you know, investment, you know, adventure and, and the markets and so forth, where Peter is like steeped in building a, a public scale company. So he's super helpful as well. Yeah. Great. Well, Todd, uh, I apologize for asking the, uh, an hour long question at the end. There, yeah, that's but, right. Um, <laughs> yes. What do you have to learn? Well, I'll be here for seven hours telling you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Part two of the podcast. Thanks right. so much for your time, Todd. I'm a, I'm a longtime fan um, and will remain one of, of yours and Okta and just love to see good people and good companies out there doing good things. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's great to be on Austin. I appreciate it.